Okay. So if you've gone through your problem sheet that we have given shared with you on inner products, there is there are a few questions on this idea of so-called adjoints and self-adjoints. So I'd like to just revisit that a bit because we haven't discussed that at all in this class. Where do they originate from? So you know we have vector spaces that are also inner product spaces, right? And the moment we have an inner product like this, what do we say? We pick up an object, all right, v1 and an object in it's that same vector space, right? So this is let's say the inner product in the vector space v and this maps to an object in the field. Of course, the field is either R or C. Now suppose without loss of generality, you have this linear transformation phi, which is a mapping from one inner product space V to another inner product space W. So this is an inner product space. This is another inner product space. Right? So here's what we say about this. Suppose you let phi act on an object V inside V. So now this belongs to W. Yeah? If you take its inner product with some W, so this is then the inner product that is de defined in the vector space W. Yeah. If you can find another, if phi star is such that it's a mapping from W to V, such that this is true. What is? So here's what's happening here. Notice phi v. Yeah, so phi v is after v has been acted on by phi, it's taken it to w. And then you're taking its inner product with some arbitrary w in w. All right? And you get something in the field, which could be r or c. Now, I'm saying that if instead you had allowed this transformation phi star to act on that chosen arbitrary w so that the inner product of v with phi star acting on w, where is this dwelling now? This is the inner product defined in the vector space v. Yeah for all W in W, right? Then phi star is the adjoint of phi. So here's the idea, you have the inner product in V, you have the inner product in W, both are inner product spaces. And you have a transformation that takes you from one inner product space to the other. So what you could have done is, you could have simply gone ahead and performed the operation, performed the transformation phi on V so that you reach W and then take inner product with arbitrary vectors in W. If the number that it, this spits out turns out to be the same as the number that is spat out by this inner product now defined on V, but you don't do anything to V. So it's just sequence of operations being changed in some sense. Here, you're first acting on this using phi, going to W and then taking inner product with W, going to the field. Here, you're dwelling in V, using the fact that V is itself an inner product space. Instead, you are letting W, some arbitrary vector, which gave you this, right? Let that phi star act on that W, which gave you this so that you end up having the same number over the field. Yeah? If you can find such a map, then that is called the adjoint of the original map. So a map and its adjoint 
have the opposite effect. One maps from V to W, the other maps from W to V. Okay, so this is the definition of an adjoint. Let's take an example in the space that we understand very well. So R2s and R3s and so on. So let's say uh, phi is a mapping from R3 to R2. So what does it do? It takes uh, x1, x2, x3 and maps it to 2x1 plus x3, x2 plus uh, 5x3, all right. You can already see what the matrix of this transformation is, right. It's just going to be 2, 0, 1 and 0, 1, 5. Yeah, so at, at the heart of it is this matrix, 2, 0, 1, 0, 1, 5. So these are both inner product spaces, real inner product spaces, as simple as it can get. So what are we saying now? So what we are saying is that you let this x1, x2, x3 take uh, sorry, let us act on this. So we have 2x1 plus x3 and you have x2 plus 5x3 as a vector. Let us take this fellow's inner product with, in R2 let us call the vector v1 and v2 or let us say p1, p2. Okay. So what is this? This is 2x1 p1 plus x3 p1 plus x2 p2 plus 5 x3 p2. If I collect together terms like this, I can simply, okay, let us let's leave it there. Let us not collect together terms at this stage. Now, if there does exist some phi star, it needs to act on a fellow in R2. So for any V1 or any P1, P2 pair that I give you, I must be able to describe phi star in terms of its action on P1, P2, yeah? And it must be able to generate a three tuple, right? So can I erase this middle part? Okay, all right. So if I now let us say phi star act on P1, P2, it must give me some three tuple. So alpha 1, P1 plus alpha 2, P2, beta 1, P1 plus beta 2, P2, gamma 1, P1 plus gamma 2, P2. You agree? This is all that can happen after all, right? where this alpha 1, alpha 2, beta 1, beta 2, gamma 1, gamma 2 will be the matrix representation of the transformation phi star. So I am required to find these fellows alpha 1, alpha 2, beta 1, beta 2, gamma 1, gamma 2 such that that equals this. When its inner product is taken with, right. So what happens then? If this fellow sits as a second entry now, then I have x1, x2, x3, this fellow and on the other hand I have alpha 1, p1 plus alpha 2, p2. I could have done this in a much more sh much shorter fashion but I am just going about it in the long winded way just to show you, yeah, just not skipping any steps here. Beta 1, p1 plus beta 2, p2, gamma 1, p1 plus gamma 2, p2. So what I want is this inner product now defined in R3 to be equal to this inner product which was defined in R2. If I manage to do that and solve for alpha 1, alpha 2, beta 1, beta 2, gamma 1, gamma 2, I would have got the adjoint of phi, is it not? That is the question before us, right? So what is this going to be equal to? Alpha 1, P1, X1 
plus alpha 2 p 2 x 1 plus beta 1 p 1 x 2 plus beta 2 p 2 x 2 plus gamma 1 p 1 x 3 plus gamma 2 p 2 x 3. So, what am I going to look for now? What is my strategy going to be? Yeah, yeah, exactly. So, what happens then? What is what is alpha 1? Yeah, what is p 2 x 1? Yeah, 0, right? P 2 x 1 does not exist here, does it? P 2 x 1 has a coefficient 0 there. What is this P 1 x 2? 0 again. What is P 2 x 2? 1. What is P 1 x 3? Sorry? Yeah. And what is P 2 x 3? 5. So, notice that phi star in fact, I, because I know the answer, I can just look at that. Is it not going to just turn out to be this, right? So, in case of real inner product spaces, complex conjugation is the same as just transposition, right? Complex conjugation transpose is just the transpose because complex conjugate has no meaning here. Now, if you are dealing with complex inner product spaces, you would have seen that you would require to take the, you would be required to take the complex conjugation of each term here as well, right? So, now comes the notion of what is called a self adjoint operator. So, if it has to be self adjoint, can the two vector spaces be different? If it is an operator, then it has to be a mapping from itself to itself because as you can see the matrices themselves will not be of different sizes, right? So, self adjoint is when let me carve out a little space here and say if V is equal to W and phi is equal to phi star, then phi is self adjoint. And a beautiful thing about self adjoint operators is that they, there are two beautiful things. One, if you have a self adjoint operator, its eigenvalues are always going to be real. And the second important thing that such a matrix will always have irrespective of whether the eigenvalues are repeated or not, always have exactly n linearly independent eigenvectors. It does not matter whether the eigenvalues are repeated, right? Not just that, moreover, the eigenvectors will be orthogonal. They will give you an orthogonal basis. So, very, very special kind of operators are these self adjoint operators. In simple terms, if you look at matrices, real matrices, symmetric matrices will be representative of self adjoint operators. Over the complex field, it is basically the Hermitian matrices named after the famous mathematician Hermite, okay, who is by the way the person who is responsible for showing that E, the natural, yeah, the that number is irrational, okay? And the fact that you cannot have any polynomial with rational coefficients whose root can be E. So, Hermite showed this, okay? So, it is named after, I think his name is Charles Hermite, okay? So, it is Hermitian when you are dealing with complex inner product spaces. So, in the remainder of the time, that is what we shall endeavor to demonstrate to you, okay? That if you have so, up until this point, we have just described adjoint and self adjoint. Now, we will say that if you have a self adjoint operator over finite dimensional vector spaces, look at its matrix representation. It will be a symmetric in case of real or a Hermitian in case of a complex inner product space. So, such Hermitian operators will always have real eigenvalues and their eigenvectors will be not just distinct but orthogonal. They will form an orthogonal basis, okay? So, that is the big result. But of course, this is a very special case. You might argue that this does not help us in answering the general question we have posed that is, when can you diagonalize 
any arbitrary operator because it is a very special class of operators after all, okay. So we will take the case of Hermitian because as you see the complex field subsumes the real field, okay, all right. So we will cut the frills and we will get to the matrices, Hermitian matrices. So A is equal to A Hermitian. Suppose where of course A Hermitian is nothing but the conjugation transposed, okay. This belongs to N cross N, right. So first to show that the eigenvalues of A can only be real, okay. Suppose A V is equal to lambda V for some lambda in C and V not equal to 0 in N tuple, okay. Uh, let us take complex conjugation and transposition on both sides, okay. So this is our first expression. Second expression is this implies and is implied by V Hermitian, A Hermitian is equal to what happens to lambda? Lambda gets conjugated, yeah. Okay. So far so good, right. Okay. Now what else? If we post multiply equation 2 with V on both sides, what do we get? V Hermitian, A Hermitian, V is equal to lambda star V Hermitian V. What is on the left hand side? This A Hermitian is equal to A, right? So I might as well write V Hermitian A V is equal to lambda star. This is nothing but the norm of V squared, is it not? Right? What about the left hand side? A V is lambda V from 1. So I can just pull out this lambda and I have minus lambda star norm of V squared is equal to 0, which means lambda minus lambda star norm of V squared is equal to 0. What can I know say about norm of V squared? Non-zero of course, because it is an eigenvector, so it is not 0. So I can get rid of this. So it means lambda is equal to lambda conjugate. What sort of numbers, what sort of complex numbers are equal to their conjugates? Not unless they are real can this be true, right. So therefore any eigenvalue of a Hermitian matrix and by extension a symmetric matrix of course, because symmetric matrices are just special cases of Hermitian matrices. So any symmetric matrix or Hermitian matrix can have only real eigenvalues, clear? Great. Now, okay, suppose lambda 1 V1 dot dot, dot till lambda n Vn are eigenvalue, eigenvector pairs, lambda i's not necessarily distinct, yeah, for A, all right then V1, V2, Vn forms an orthogonal basis for Cn. All 
all right. So, we are not asking for any distinct eigenvalues or anything. It is a very special case of just Hermitian matrices, right. Suppose, so of course, if you have n is equal to 1 here, there is nothing really to prove again, yeah. Suppose n is equal to 1, obviously true. We are going to use induction, of course, you have already seen it, I suppose. So, let it be true for n is equal to k. That is, yes? No, these are vectors, eigenvectors. So, these are in C n. So, this is a basis for C n. The eigenvectors of the n cross n matrix form a basis for Cn, right? Okay. So we are assuming that if n is going up to k, it's true for every number less than or equal to k. Now we have to show that if it's true for k, it must be true for k plus one. So let a belong to C k plus one cross k plus one. All right. Suppose a v is equal to lambda v, where v is not equal to 0, which means that this is an eigenvalue eigenvector pair. In fact, I will do something better. I will just go one step further and say that the norm of v is equal to 1, that in one shot rules out v being 0, and also says that it is a normal vector. Its norm is 1. I can always do that no matter what vector you choose, just divided by its norm, it is it's scaled, right? So let us say this is, this is true, right? So by Gram-Schmidt procedure, extend V to a, to an orthonormal basis for C k plus 1, all right? Again, nothing fancy. You start with one vector, which is linearly independent, of course, because it is not 0. You can always extend it to be a basis for k plus 1 dimensional vector space. Now, if you permit me to erase this, I am going to use this entire space up now. Let us write this in the following manner. So, let this basis be given by V, V1, V2, till v k, okay. Only v is the eigenvector, remember. The others are just going to complete the orthonormal basis. Hmm? So let us take a, v, v1, this is now the matrix k. And what is this going to be equal to? Let us call this the vector v, right. This is going to be equal to lambda v a v1 until a v k, all right. Let us hit this on both sides using v Hermitian. What that would lead to is the following, v Hermitian v1 Hermitian. So, these are row vectors now, agreed? And this is vk Hermitian. This is a and this is v v1 vk is equal to what? What can you say about this? v Hermitian v is 1, right? So, this will just leave behind lambda here, is it not? What about the second term? 
I mean, if you hit V V1 Hermitian with this, what can you say? The term here I'm talking about. This is an orthonormal basis. So inner product of V with V1, V2, V3 till all of the others is zero. So this is zero, zero. This entire thing is zero, is it not? Correct? These things I don't care about for the time being, except that when the time comes, I will use that. Now what is the size of this block? K cross K, agreed, okay. This is clear, no doubts about this. See what I am doing is I am right, I have not written this V Hermitian in on the right hand side, perhaps I should have, but this is the same matrix that is acting here also as this V Hermitian. So this thing acting on this is just going to give you lambda because V Hermitian V is 1. This thing acting on this is going to give you 0, the subsequent all other fellows until V K Hermitian acting on V will give you 0, so this is 0. But now I have this important observation, V Hermitian A V the whole Hermitian is equal to what? It is equal to now the order gets reversed. So observe that this is equal to V Hermitian A Hermitian V which because A Hermitian is equal to A turns out to be V Hermitian A V which means what? That this matrix is therefore also Hermitian. Yeah, If this matrix is Hermitian what must these entries be? 0, well because this every element below lambda here is 0, so every element to the right of this also had better be 0, right. So therefore this is 0, this is 0, this is 0, this is 0 due to symmetry, symmetry argument, yeah. If that is so what are we eventually left with? We are left with this being equal to some lambda and a whole row of zeros and a whole column of zeros and some poor little a hat which is what exactly? It is of size k cross k. Is it Hermitian? Well of course because this whole thing is Hermitian means this is also Hermitian. But from the base step assumption what do we know? That any object of size k or lower can always be diagonalized. So therefore, this means that there exists u such that u Hermitian a hat u is equal to some lambda hat where this is diagonal. Yeah, because if this is an orthogonal basis, it is linearly independent. If this is linearly independent, you know these are eigenvectors, so they will diagonalize. So then, what is it? Can we not write? Uh, well, we will say that V Hermitian A V is equal to lambda. 0, 0 and this is u, u Hermitian, agreed? Yeah, right? Lambda hat, yes, sorry. Lambda hat, u lambda hat, u Hermitian, right? What is that? That is nothing but 1, 0, 0, u, lambda, 0, 0, lambda hat times 1, 0, 0, u Hermitian where this fellow here is diagonal of course, right? So then 
this finally leads to us to conclude what? If we hit it with 1, 0, 0, U Hermitian, V Hermitian, A, V, 1, 0, 0, U is equal to lambda, lambda hat, which is the diagonal matrix. All that we need to show is that this fellow is what? An orthogonal matrix, yeah? It's an orthonormal matrix. In fact, the fact that this, when multi multiplied by its complex conjugate transposed, will lead to identity. So this I leave to you as an exercise to show that, show that 1, 0, 0, u v times, of course, I've just spelt it out almost. There's hardly much to do now for you. V mission is equal to identity. And we are done. Why? Because now I've shown you that this is exactly the basis set. Right? That diagonalizes it. And once you have diagonalized it, of course, those are the eigenvectors, right? So for this very special class of self-adjoint operators over finite dimensional vector spaces, you'll always be able to diagonalize them, and this is beautiful. Unfortunately, we don't have time for the uh, applications that I had spoken about, but we'll delve into those in the next lecture. We'll show you what all applications this has, starting with a test for positive definiteness or lack thereof to certain special curves such as um, ellipses, hyperbolas, parabolas in 2D, to volumes or quadric surfaces such as paraboloids and hyperboloids, etc. So that's all in the next lecture. Thank you.